Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. And the primary reason that I chose this question is statement two. So let's all focus our attention for a moment on statement two. What is statement two saying? If Khalil had driven at an average speed that was 25% faster, his driving time would have been reduced by 20%. This statement reminds me of an interview question, a job interview question that we all were preparing for when I was doing my MBA at NYU. It was a very common interview question at Goldman Sachs and uh, a lot of other firms. Here's what they would ask. They would ask the following. If your investment portfolio lost 20% in one year, what percent must it gain the following year to get back to its original starting point? And the most common wrong answer is 20%, right? What do people say? Well, if I lost 20%, What's the opposite of losing 20%? Gaining 20%. So, so they say you'd have to gain 20% to get back to the starting point. The problem is that they're thinking about percentages additively. Right? They're thinking, well, a 20% loss means minus 20%. And what's the opposite of minus? Plus. So plus 20%. But percents are not an additive operation. They're a multiplicative operation, which is something I really harp on a lot in my book. So... Instead of thinking of it as plus and minus, we should be thinking in both cases about multiplying. What are we multiplying by? A 20% loss means we're multiplying by 80% or four-fifths. And what's the opposite of multiplying by four-fifths? Multiplying by five-fourths. And multiplying by five-fourths means a 20% increase. So that's why this question, look, I mean, even the numbers are the same. If he had driven at an average speed that was 25% faster, his driving time would have been reduced by 20%. And my reaction to that is, that's always true. This statement isn't actually stating anything at all. It's just saying something that's obvious. Now it goes back to what, remember JD, when the author wrote comma, of course, comma? And you were like, oh, that's like saying, duh. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Of course this is true. This is always true. If you reduce your speed... Uh, uh, by, uh, or in this case, if you increase your speed by 25%, meaning you're multiplying it by five-fourths, the time that it takes would be four-fifths in order for the uh -huh. distance to remain the same. This is always true. So can you all let me know in the chat box, which answer choices can you eliminate when you see a statement that says something that is always true, something that's just obvious? In this case, statement two is, is literally adding zero value. I don't even need to read the question to eliminate answer choices. And who cares what the question is asking? If you're giving me a statement that is just saying something that is obvious, that is always true, what can you eliminate? If statement two is sufficient on its own, that means that also having no statements at all would be sufficient. Is there an answer true. choice that says we don't need statements? Is that an option? I used to joke that that's answer choice F for fail. <laughs> don't, need answer don't need statements. That's not a thing. So when a statement is literally giving no information whatsoever, that statement can't be sufficient on its own, nor can that statement help the other statement become sufficient, which was answer choice C. So C doesn't make sense, because if, if one is not sufficient on its own, bringing in two won't help. But answer choice C claims that it would help. So C is gone, and of course B is gone, because statement, a statement that's not saying anything can't be sufficient on its own, and for the same reason, D is gone. So we're down to two answer choices without even reading the question. Just from recognizing that statement two is saying something that is obvious and is always true. And why is it always true? Because here we're multiplying by five-fourths, and here we're multiplying by four-fifths. So of course, if your speed is multiplied by five-fourths and your time is multiplied by four-fifths, your overall distance will, won't change. It will remain the same. Because these are reciprocals of one another. And there's a reciprocal relationship between speed and the time that the distance takes. Before we evaluate statement one, I want to share with you three other official GMAT questions.
Okay, next I want you to look at this one. And finally, You see anything in common among those three questions? Correct, exactly. Correct. They're all multiplicative stories, just like this one. And in all of them, the changes to the factors of the multiplicative story are additive changes, not multiplicative changes, right? In statement two here, those are multiplicative changes. A percent increase or decrease, that's a multiplicative change. It's a ratio. We can say that, you know, we're multiplying the speed by such and such. We're multiplying by the time by such and such. But in all of those other cases, the changes were additive, addition and subtraction to the factors. So in the case of Don and his hourly, so you've got your hourly rate multiplied by your number of hours equals the total uh, income, right? And if the hourly rate goes up, then the number of hours go down in order to keep the product the same. Uh, the same goes for the, the other two questions with the towels. In the towels question, it was e even the same product, right? It was $120 total for towels. It's 120 kilometers total here. So it's, it's the same number even. It's very similar. Now, having seen those other three questions, which were not data sufficiency, mind you, they were, not, they were problem solving. And so there was a, a, one correct answer choice to those questions. Just based on that, we should be able to say here, yes, statement one is sufficient on its own because I know that in such questions, when they come up in problem solving, there is one answer, one correct answer. So that's without even doing any thinking about why is it sufficient on its own, just from experience with other such questions on the GMAT, which were not data sufficiency, but rather they were problem solving, that in, its, in and of itself should be enough to say the correct answer is A. Now I will briefly talk about why it is that there's a unique answer, because I think that's not intuitive at all. And I also will uh, make a note, which I also posted in the forum, building a quadratic e equation to solve those questions, in my opinion, is inappropriate on a GMAT. The correct approach is to just use the answer choices uh, to figure out which one is right. Much faster way to do it. The one where it's most tricky is that boat one with a V plus three and V minus three, but I posted my uh, the way that I would do that on the, on the forum. So how do we wrap our heads around why it's a unique solution? Let's look at different ways to get a product of 120. So you can do 1 times 120, 2 times 60, 3 times 40, 4 times 30. Let's just stop there, although of course we could keep going. Here's what I want you to observe. When you add 1 here, you lose 60 here. Yes? But when I add another one, so now I'm adding one to a different point, this time I'm only losing 20. So the first time I removed, uh, the first time I added one, I lost 60, but then I added one again and I only lost 20. And now I'll add one again and I'm going to lose 10. And what do you think will happen if I add one again? Well, now I'll only lose six. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it that the bigger my starting point, the less of a big deal it would be to add one. I mean, in the first case, when you're adding one, you're doubling. But then in the second case, you're only increasing by 50%, and then you're only increasing by 33%, and then you're only increasing by 25%. So it's, a, it's less and less of a big deal to be adding that one. And so it makes sense that as you add one to a bigger and bigger starting point, the resulting subtraction of the other factor will be smaller and smaller because it's less and less of a big deal to be adding one as you go up. And I got an email from JD right before this session where he actually drew an XY coordinate plane, which I love, where you have speed and time. And the observation that he made was that the graph is not a straight line. And I can do that for you here right now, right? If this is one, two, three, four, and five, just as an example, we're starting at 120. And then we go to 60, which is half. So we're going from here to here. And then we're going to 40, 30, 24. So that would be 
here, here, here. So the graph looks kind of like this, not a straight line, which means that the slope is always changing. Right? Here it's a very, very steep slope in the beginning, and the slope gets smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually it's almost zero. So it starts from <laughs> practically negative infinity and eventually is, you know, negative 0 0.001 or something like that at the end. And because the slope is always changing, you're always going to get a unique solution. Yeah, so for a given speed, your time and your distance will be directly correlated, right? You double your time, you'll double your distance. You triple your time, you triple your distance. Same goes for a given time. If the, if the time is given, then the speed and distance are directly correlated. You double your speed, you double your distance. You triple your speed, you triple your distance. That, those would result in straight lines. But here, it's not the speed that's given, it's not the time that's given, it's the distance that's given. The product is given. Just as was in, uh, in those other three questions that I showed. In all of those cases, the product was set and the factors were the things that were changing, right? The product here is 336. That's given. The product here is 120. That's given. The product here is 90 miles. That's given. And with Khalil, the product was 120 kilometers. That's given. Okay, so that's the difference. So if you're thinking about a graph that's a straight line, there the product was not given, there one of the factors was given, and we drew a graph to show the other factor vis-a-vis -vis or, or versus the, uh, the product. So I think the most important takeaway from this question, well, actually two most important takeaways, and the, the reasons why I chose this question for this course, one was uh, this really important observation that statement two is saying something that's obvious, and it needs to be obvious either before you go to business school or by the time you finish business school. So might as well get that into our, uh, into our system now ahead of time, uh, especially since it can come up on the GMAT. And, and look, you can eliminate three out of five answer choices without even reading the question. So I think that's a really important takeaway from this question. And I, I have a whole chapter in the book about how to think about these stories and, and how to work with other numbers. So it's not just 25% and 20%, but that's the most common one because the numbers work out really nicely there. And then the other takeaway was seeing what the, all of these questions have in common, right? Where you, you have a given product and then you have additive changes to the two factors. And that's going to lead to a unique solution. Here, in this case, we didn't have to find the solution. We just had to know that it would be a unique solution but we could know that it would be a unique solution from our experience with these three questions that I referred to. And these are all official GMAT questions, so you can tell it is a story that the GMAT likes. It's a story where you have a set product of two factors, and then those two factors, one is increased and one is decreased by, uh, by actual amounts, not by a percent, not by a fraction, but by additive changes. Yeah, and I just want to say on that point that testing cases and data sufficiency when you're not at the test center is, in my opinion, a, a terrible mistake because the best case scenario is you'll get to the right answer and learn nothing. That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is you, I don't know, don't get to the right answer and it decreases your confidence level uh, and introduces a lot of anxiety. But the best thing that can happen when you're at home testing cases is you pick the right answer and learn nothing from it. And that's not a very good scenario, right? You, we we want to learn something from every question that we're doing, otherwise we're wasting time. Now at the test center, I think that testing cases is sometimes better than nothing, uh, sometimes worse than nothing, because if it causes you to spend four minutes on the question, then you would have been better off with nothing. So it can go either way. Right? So I'm, I don't, I'm not categorically against testing cases at the test center, but I am categor categorically against testing cases at home as your only approach. It's okay to do it if you're just practicing testing cases, because again, there are times where it might be appropriate to do so in the GMAT, on the actual test. But if that's all you're doing at home and then you move on to the next question, then you've really just wasted your time in my opinion. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. 
And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.